Okay. okay. Uh, this is an interview with Paul Staub at the Freeport, Long Island uh, Armory, Freeport, New York. It is August 9th, 2002. Uh, the interviewer is Michael Russert. It's approximately 10:10 10, 10 a.m. Uh, could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sure. My name is Paul Staub. Uh, I was born October 21st, 1925, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, but I lived in New York most of my life. Uh, that was the chance I forgot already. <laughs> oh, that was it? Yeah, that was it. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, what was your uh, pre-war education? I, uh, I went to the New York City Public Schools and I was, I was at the, my last year at Stuyvesant High School and uh, that's when I went into service. Did you finish high school uh, or did you? No, I had fin they had sent me my diploma. I had gone to the, towards the end of the term. I went into service. Did you have any, did you work at all prior to joining the service? Yeah, I had a lot of jobs. I was, I delivered the Bronx Home News, I worked in a candy store, I did some defense work, uh, part-time. Most of my jobs were part-time because I was going to school. Mm -hmm. I worked for uh, National Tool and Die, which were making some kind of parts for the Army, for the, the war effort, and uh, odd jobs here and there. Can you uh, tell me um, where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor and what your reaction was to it? Yeah, I was with a group of friends and we were watching some ball game or other, or we were listening to a ball game. And we weren't watching at the time, there was, there was no television. And we heard it over the radio. <coughs> and uh, we weren't sure exactly where Pearl Harbor was, but uh, we learned very quickly. Okay, um, were you enlisted or did you, or drafted? No, I, I was drafted. I was uh, 18 in October, and by November I was on my way into the military. Mm -hmm. And you went into the Army. Right. Uh, could you tell us, starting with basic training, uh, where you went and yeah. what kind of uh, experiences you had? Well, I was inducted, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was there a couple of days and was sent to Camp Croft, South Carolina for basic training. After that I went to uh, Mississippi, Camp Shelby, and I was assigned to the 69th Division Infantry. Which, uh, and I trained with them for uh, several months. And then we were ordered overseas. What kind of uh, relationships did you uh, have with uh, some of the Southerners being from New York State? Well, not only being from New York State, I'm, I'm also Jewish. Mm -hmm. and they, <coughs> Expected all kinds of funny things from me, I guess, and uh, it took a while for them to get to know me and me to get to know them, but eventually we got along pretty good. Okay. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. I had an acting corporal who thought he was a general, he was a southern corporal, he thought he was a general, and he was, uh, I think it was his ambition to make my life miserable. But as I say, we, after a while, we got to know each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, how did you get overseas? What kind of? Uh, I went over with I went over with the division. The division was uh, sent over. We uh, came back to uh, from Camp Shelby. We came to uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, which was great for me because I was close to home. We got some passes, and uh, then we embarked uh, from uh, I guess it was Staten Island or Lower New York. We walked and uh, I went over with the division. What kind of ship was it? Was it an old liner or a troop no, ship? No, it was or? a troop ship. It was uh, either converted to a troop ship or built as a troop ship. I'm not sure, but it was a troop ship. Uh, it was a miserable crossing, of course. Half Why the, was that? Half the guys were seasick. And uh, it had a lot of men in a small area. And it took about. Uh, it was about 12, 13 days to get across, and we went to uh, England. We, and we landed at, uh, I think we went to Southampton, and then by truck or by something or rail, we ended up going to Winchester, England, which was outside of London, and we regrouped there, still as a division. 
And uh, what, what about what date did you arrive there? What month and year? Uh, got it written down. <laughs> we uh, got there about. Uh, I think it was either uh, November, October, or November of 1944, mm -hmm. and we stayed there for a while. And that time, the, the Battle of Bulge was in full, full force, and part of the men were reassigned to go to leave the division and fill in occupancies uh, for the divisions that had been uh, attacked by the Germans in the Bulge. And uh, we left England. What was left of the division left England uh, about January. And uh, we were thrown into battle. Well, we went to France and Belgium, and uh, we went into battle just about then. The uh, Battle of Bulge was just getting under control. And we went into the Hurtigan Forest. We were assigned Hurtigan Forest overlooking the uh, Siegfried Line. We could see the hounds teeth from, from the forest. And that was my uh, introduction to combat. It was a miserable, rainy day, the kind of day you would see if you, if you were in a movie and they were introducing you to a miserable day, that would be the kind of a day it was. Uh, and uh, 60, again, we stayed as a division. We were the 69th Division. They brought us up to full strength with replacements. Uh, we crossed the Siegfried Line and we kept going. We captured uh, many cities, many Germans. Uh, one of the biggest cities that we took was Leipzig. We uh, had a real running battle out there. Uh, and we stayed, uh, I stayed on the lines pretty much till the end of the war. From that now point. I noticed here it said you were with an intelligence and reconnaissance unit. Could you describe what? Yeah. Some of your duties were? Uh, your I, I was assigned to a headquarters company, 1st Battalion, 273rd Regiment. And I was assigned to the R&R platoon, which was the intelligence and reconnaissance group. And it was our job to uh, go in advance of the troops to let them know what they were going to come up, come into or, or uh, could be confronted with. Uh, after Leipzig, we hit uh, my group went to a town called Wurzen, which was about, I think, 10 or 15 miles from Leipzig. And uh, we, one morning, uh, outside of our command post, there, was, there were uh, lines and lines of refugees, hundreds of refugees uh, in wagons, pulling carts, and all going towards the American lines. But we had orders to go see where what was going on, go see what, you know, where they were coming from and about how many there were. So four of us, uh, my lieutenant and two other men and myself took off to uh, find out what was going on. It seemed they were running away from the Russians, these, these displaced persons were running away from the Russians heading toward the American lines. Uh, in our travels, which we ended up about 20, 25 miles in front of the lines, we kept hearing that uh, there were prisoners just ahead of us, and American prisoners. And uh, so we wanted to, you know, see if we can do something about getting them back to the lines. Uh, we captured a lot of uh, Germans surrendering at this point, a lot of Germans running away. Uh, we captured. Hundred, literally hundreds of them. They were, they were in groups, and uh, I would talk to them. I, I, I spoke a little Yiddish, which is close to German, so I would speak to them and tell them, telling them, go back to the American lines. I was right up, good conduct passes for them to get back to Wurzen, and it worked. I found out later many of them got back there with the passes because everybody wanted to know who's Paul Stop signing all these passes. Uh, well, we did find a, a, a prisoner of war camp that had a lot of political prisoners, a lot of Americans in them, 
Uh, in fact, there was one lieutenant they picked up in Italy, a, a Navy lieutenant, that they had captured in Italy. And the rumor was that most of these people were, gonna, were supposed to die. They were going to get killed. We captured some of the guards that were there, and uh, we turned them over to the prisoners. Then we heard that the Russians may be in the next town. It was the town of Torgau. So we, uh, we said, let's go, let's go see what's doing. We had no intention of meeting Russians when we started, but this is, this came about. Uh, we went into, uh, towards Torgau, and on the way we uh, confiscated a bed sheet from somebody because our lieutenant felt that we should be able to identify ourselves. And we got to the, to the edge of Torgau and uh, we walked through the town carrying this bed sheet on, on a pole. But there was firing, snipers were firing at us, somebody was firing at us. And we decided all of a sudden, this is stupid, we're not surrendering to anybody. Let's make a flag out of this uh, bed sheet. We broke into an apothecary, a drugstore, and with drugs and other kind of chemicals, we painted a flag out of his bed sheet, you know, some stripes, and, and we carried this. And we went through the town, we didn't see any Russians, but we got to the edge of the Elbe River, and on the edge, this is like a movie, <laughs> is a castle, I think it's called Hottenfeld Castle. Lieutenant and I went up to the top of this castle and we overlooked the Elbe and there on the other side were Russian soldiers. We started to wave the flag and hollering, you know, Merikonsky, don't shoot. But they weren't buying it. They were shooting at us. <laughs> they thought it was a trick. And we're waving this flag and uh, finally we decided we better do something about this before we, we get killed. We went back downstairs and we sent the jeep back to this prisoner of war camp for somebody who could speak Russian. And then we took him up to the top of the castle and he hollered across in Russia that the Americans don't shoot. Uh, and the Russian, and then very close by there was a bridge that was blown up over the Elbe. And the Russians, we could see them starting to run towards the bridge and my lieutenant and, uh, and uh, Frank Huff, one of the men on the patrol, they ran towards the bridge on our side and they started across the bridge. And right in the middle, where the bridge had blown up like a V, and that's where the Russians and the Americans made the first contact. Uh, I took some pictures. Uh, the lieutenant crossed to the other side, stayed uh, a little while. The Russians came to our side. Uh, I didn't cross the bridge, I stayed on our side, and the Russians came over, we uh, patted each other on the back, climbed, shook, shook hands, showed each other pictures of our families, and uh, had a couple of drinks. And we had, uh, we spent, you know, maybe an hour or so just uh, throwing a baloney. Lieutenant Robinson came back, and we, he decided it's time we better get back to where we belong. And we went back, we took uh, four Russians with us. Four Russian soldiers went back with us. When we got back to camp, the commander thought we had picked up some displaced persons and sort of, you know, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that. And we explained to him that he was part of the Russian army. He called up, uh, this was battalion headquarters. He called regimental headquarters and told them what happened. They said, oh, get those men back here. So we went, now we were one jeep when we started, so now we're about six jeeps, so we're going back to regimental headquarters, and uh, we get there, and the regimental commander called the division commander. He said, get the men back here. They weren't supposed to meet the Russians. Doesn't anybody know what's going on? Because they had sent patrol, we, now we found out they had sent patrols out to meet the Russians. We're back in division headquarters, and they, they locked the four of us up in a room. Don't talk to anybody, because the place was swarming with reporters and press people, radio people, everybody wanted to know what was going on. Anyway, we got locked up. We were sure we were going to get court-martialed. And uh, finally they called back uh, 
Army headquarters to say that the contact was made. And he stands in general there and said, great. Now the word came back, great, 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 everybody's fine. <laughs> they let us out of the room. <laughs> Had some toasts, you know. And uh, they wanted us to make arrangements for the generals to meet the following day. So now we went back to the Elbe River. We had about 20 jeeps at this point. A lot of correspondents, a lot, a lot of press people, a lot of uh, all kinds of people. And uh, arrangements were made for the, for the two generals to meet the following day, which they did. General Reinhardt, who was the uh, uh, general of the division, came and uh, he, went, he went across the Elbe River in a little kayak, in a boat. <laughs> They rode across, actually, and they met, and then by that time, party started, and everybody was a little nuts and celebrating. We went to sleep. The four of us were so tired, we, we went to sleep. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, the four of us got orders to go to Paris, fly to Paris, for press conferences. You take four GIs off the front lines, dirty, sweaty, you know, they take them to Paris and give them some money and some new clothes and put up at a good hotel. They put us up at the Hotel Scream where all the reporters were staying. And uh, we all did our thing. I mean, I, I made a broadcast which they played in New York, uh, which my father had heard in the, in the uh, I forget what station, and they sent him a record of the broadcast. And it was a very exciting time. Uh, we were there for a couple of days, and we were getting ready to go back. And th this time, the P also the peace effort had started. Uh, there was uh, negotiations of the uh, peace treaty that the war was over. Hitler shot himself while we were there, and it was very exciting. Uh, somebody had suggested to us that we give the flag that we made to General Eisenhower, who was in Reims, uh, safe headquarters, which was just outside of Paris. Somebody set it up, and we, sure enough, uh, a staff car picked us up at the, a hotel, drove us to uh, Eisenhower's headquarters, introduced us to General Eisenhower. We walked into a room, he was there with his aide, and uh, you could feel the vibration in the room. I mean, the guy was very dynamic. Uh, he spoke to each one of us, he asked us what we did in the Army, how long we'd been in there. <coughs> And uh, we gave him the flag, and he held it up, and he took pictures and all. And he turns around to his aide, and he said, I want these men promoted as of right now. And if there's any question about it, have their company commanders get in touch with me. We walked out of his office, and I, I came from a PFC to a corporal. That quick. It was, the press said it was probably one of the fastest promotions on records. And it was great, it was nice. Uh, we then went back to Germany, we went back to the 69th Division. The lieutenant was assigned to come back to the States to do a, a bond tour, to sell war bonds. And we were assigned <coughs> various duties. We, uh, at that time they started, the war was over. Eisenhower had signed a peace with uh, Admiral Donitz at, at the headquarters that we had been in. And uh, they started to break up the division. They, they weren't sure exactly what was going to happen, but to us as individuals, but the division was going back to the States with men who had enough points to get out of the Army at this point. Uh, I was assigned to the uh, 29th Division, and uh, they didn't know what to do with me. I was a corporal. There weren't that many corporals in the Army, unless you were a tech. Uh, a tech corporal, you know, a clerk or something. So I had pretty good duty. And he, <clears throat> as I said, he couldn't find too much for me to do when I was doing, I was doing it. Uh, shortly after that, I, I, got, I got hurt while I was in the 29th Division. I uh, had a jeep accident. I ended up in a hospital. And while I was there, they dropped the bomb in Japan, because I was sure that's where I was headed for. Uh, they dropped the bomb in Japan, the war ended, and uh, I had enough points to come home at this, this, this time. I had forgotten something. <clears throat> we were given medals. 
by the American Army for our uh, part that we did in, in meeting the Russians. Now, is this the Bronze Star? I noticed you yeah, the Bronze Star. Bronze Star. And then the Russians also uh, decorated the four of us. Uh, I was wondering, I saw that you the Russian Order of Glory. Order of Glory, Class 1, which, <clears throat> which I, I found out later was the highest uh, medal that they would give an enlisted man. And uh, it was a nice ceremony, it was a good ceremony, and that was done in, uh, in Leipzig. Anyway, I had enough points to come home at this point, I went home. <clears throat> now, I, I didn't give too much thought to the, the meeting uh, with the Russians, but as the years passed, every once in a while, uh, somebody would want to know what's doing. You know, how am I doing? What do I remember? Uh, what do I think about this? Uh, I got a call from the State Department <clears throat> and during the little Cold War started right after we met the Russians. I got a call from the State Department. They want to make a broadcast over, at that time, Radio Free Europe to behind the, the uh, Iron Curtain. Uh, would I be willing to come to Washington and uh, take part in, in this broadcast? He said, sure. I uh, <clears throat> went to Washington, and at the presidential room in the Senate, I, made, I helped make a broadcast, and at that time, uh, Vice President Nixon was there. I'm sitting in a chair in this beautiful room in the, in the uh, Senate, and there was uh, Vice President Nixon sitting on his side, and uh, Senator Douglas, and many other uh, several other uh, uh, representatives. And we did a broadcast that was played behind the Iron Curtain. It, it, <clears throat> you know, my part was to like, talk to one of the men, that I, one of the Russians that I had met on, on, the, uh, on the meeting and talk to him about how things were in America and, and try and do something about this Cold War. Uh, That was one incident. Uh, another time I had gotten a call, an invitation to come to the uh, embassy, the Russian embassy in Washington. Uh, they were celebrating a, uh, an anniversary and they wanted anybody who had anything to do with the Russians during the war. <clears throat> and at this embassy they had uh, flyers that were attached to them, uh, Navy people who were, had something to do with the Russians. and. Uh, it was a nice affair. <clears throat> I got to meet uh, De Brunyan, the ambassador De Brunyan at the time. And while he assigned, uh, and one of my colleagues that was in honor patrol was also there, Frank Huff from Virginia, Washington, Virginia. He was there. And we hadn't seen each other since, since the original meeting. Now, this what was, year was this? This was about 25 years later. It was the 25th anniversary. And, uh, so we saw each other and actually we hugged, we killed, we killed whatever. And, and a couple of Russian soldiers saw what was going on, wanted to know what was going on, you know, what, why. So we told them, and they uh, took us back to Dubrunian, and they explained to him, well, and there were many people at this affair, and he, got, he sent them to get some books that were written up about the affair, about the meeting, and he had given us several books. And uh, he, they had minted a ruble to come commemorate the affair. And they had, they had one, so they gave it to Frank. He was older. So they gave him the ruble. And a few minutes later, <clears throat> the runner came over and he says, listen, he says, I also have a, a ruble. He said, I want you to have it. And he gave me his own, which I thought was terrific. Uh, Naturally, I, I flew home. I didn't have to take the train or nothing. I flew home without a plane. I was flying high. It was a great, it was a great experience. Uh, <clears throat> I had been interviewed several times uh, since then. Uh, TASS, the official Russian newspaper at that time, sent the reporter to the house, and uh, he interviewed me, and uh, we spoke for quite a while. And. Uh, he said, you might get an invitation to come to Russia because they're planning something. And 
And that never came about. But as he was leaving, he handed me a bottle of vodka, <laughs> which was very nice. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I, re I received a, a notice that they were making, this was for the 50th anniversary, they were making postage stamps to uh, commemorate the ending of the war or the war times. And one of the photographs that I had taken at the meeting was being considered for a postage stamp. I get it. Well, they wanted my permission. Of course, they gave my permission. And uh, anyway, they made a postage stamp out of one of the pictures that I had taken. And uh, which was great. I consider it my stamp. Uh, <clears throat> for the 50th anniversary, they also had a ceremony at Arlington Cemetery. And at that at that me at that uh, ceremony, they planted at Arlington some trees and they put a monument in the ground to uh, commemorate the meeting of the Russians. There were a couple of Russian generals there. Uh, I was there. There were several other people there. And they also showed a copy of the stamp that hadn't come out yet, but was coming out within a couple of days. And of course, uh, that was a great, great occasion. Uh, the stamp was issued. I guess I have several copies, of course. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much uh, my story. I'm sure I left some things out, but uh, it was, it was well, a I great experience. What you told us is, 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 of course, there aren't too many people that have that story. That, that was great. <clears throat> you come. I guess the uh, you know, easy question to ask is, how did the war affect your life? I guess it, it's had quite a significance, hasn't it? Well, it, it, it hasn't, uh, yes, it has been a, you know, a big significant part. I, I, uh, I have these memories every once in a while that, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, every year for the anniversary, when the anniversary comes around, uh, I start reliving. I go back 60 years, 50 years, or whatever it is, and I, and I remember the days. Uh, I'm the last uh, survivor of the patrol, of that particular patrol. Uh, as I said, there were other patrols that went out that also met the Russians, but they were patrols of uh, maybe 26 men, 50 men. And uh, just recently, I had written an article. I, I had a list of all the men in the various patrols. And I listed all, because, it, because whenever they mentioned the patrols, they mentioned the patrols as the, the Robinson Patrol. Robinson was the lieutenant in charge of, and there was another patrol by uh, several other lieutenants that went out. But they never, mentioned all the men that were in the patrols. I had a list of these men, and I wrote an article stating, saying, I, I was curious if anybody else was alive mm -hmm. other than me. And I've heard from one or two of them since I wrote the article. And uh, we, we remember things, uh, uh, because it's, it's tough. Some of this stuff, I used to bounce off. When the guys were alive, I would call somebody up and say, Hey, I remember this. Do you remember this or am I dreaming, you know? And yeah, yeah, that's the way it happened. That's the way it happened. Uh, while the lieutenant was alive, uh, we would talk at least once or twice a year. He lived in California, and he became a neurosurgeon. And he was a retired neurosurgeon. Uh, and it was great to bounce stuff off of him. Uh, Around the 50th anniversary, we all got a call from, from a British television uh, station, Yorkshire Television, and he wanted to make a documentary. And they had the four of us, and we, we all lived in different locations. Uh, the tenant lived in California, uh, Huff lived in uh, Washington, Virginia, McDonald lived in uh, Peabody, Massachusetts, and I lived down here. Well, they had the four of us meet in Washington. At, a, at a, uh, a bar, a pub, and they, they filmed it and they recorded our, our, our remarks and our, uh, and the, uh, 
newspaper got wind of it and they come down to the bar and we were taking pictures. And we had a heck of a day. We had a hell of a day. And we hadn't seen each other when, uh, except for I saw Frank <coughs> at that Russian embassy. And I think I saw the, the uh, lieutenant once. So we hadn't seen each other in close to 50 years. And uh, we reminisced, we talked, we, uh, we told about our families. And uh, that's how it affected my life, really. And I, I still uh, live in the past. They, they are in Germany, in Torgau. They erected a monument on the site, supposedly, of where the meeting took place. And they have, they have a, uh, every year they have uh, a celebration. The people are talking out, and uh, some, of the, some of the GIs go there, go back for the occasion. And uh, just recently, I, I guess they got a call from Germany. Am I interested in coming for the celebration this year? Because it's in April, uh, April 25th, 1945, is when we met. Mm -hmm. And they celebrated, you know, right around that time over here. And uh, I keep getting invitations over the years, but I've never come back. Uh, the lieutenant went several times. Uh, McDonald and Huff never went. And uh, I don't know, so I keep thinking about it. You know, I, you, live in, you live in the past. You think you will? Uh, I get all steamed up when, when the invitation comes. And... Uh, I think I'm going to go, and then I back down. Something comes up, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I really don't know at this point. Uh, this guy, this uh, Dr. Nielsen in German, in Torgau, is the head of some kind of a committee that, that keeps this in perpetual, per per perpetuity. And uh, when he called, he wanted me to come. I don't. Know. I got to think about it. And Did you ever make use of the GI Bill at all? Oh yeah, yeah. When I got out, I, I went to City College for a couple of years, but my head wasn't there. I never could get my head back straight. And uh, I worked for uh, a clothing store, <coughs> Bond Bond Clothes. You familiar with them? Yes. And I worked for them for uh, almost forty years. I started out as a. Uh, a lackey, and I ended up owning part of the company before we went bankrupt. <laughs> and uh, that kept me pretty busy. Uh, I got married, I have a couple of kids. What year did you marry? 1948. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife was a nurse at that time. She, she was in the, uh, the Nurse Cadet Corps. People don't even know about that thing anymore. They, there was a shortage of nurses. And they, they formed this uh, Nurse Cadet Corps to train women to be nurses and then eventually go into service. And my wife was part of that group. Uh, but the war ended, which was great. So she became, she was a nurse. And uh, she isn't well right now, but uh, we were married uh, a lot of years, 52, 53 years. I got two kids, boy and a girl, Tommy and Lori. I got five grandchildren. Tommy has a boy and a girl. Uh, am I all right? No, you're fine. I was just looking to see if the light was blinking. Okay. You tell me how close we are to the end. Okay, you got it. Okay. Six. Okay. I have uh, grandchildren, Scott and Sue, and my daughter Lori has three children. Uh, Beth. Michael and Mitchell, she's married to a fine young man, John. And they live out in Comac. She lives in Comac. My son lives in Levittown. Now we're pretty close. And, uh, where well, am I? That's it. What else you got? I'm sorry. Did you, you stay, stay in contact with the men that you were with in this group, have you ever joined a veterans organization at all? Well, yeah, I belong to the Jewish War Veterans, the American Legion, uh, disabled war veterans, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never, took, never active though. Mm -hmm. uh, I became a, I was a volunteer fireman in Levittown for several years. 
And then I became president of the synagogue, the temple, the Israel Community Center, whatever town. And I was active in those areas, in those groups. Uh, Do you uh, ever attend any reunions of your no, regiment? Or no, in fact, there's a reunion coming up uh, in September in Virginia. The 69th has a, a reunion every year. Uh, when it was first formed, it was formed in New York, and we had a couple of uh, reunions then, but that was like 60 years ago. And uh, I haven't re gone to any since they went out of New York. Uh, but they have a great turnout. You get a couple of hundred guys coming. And I've been thinking very seriously about maybe going to Virginia for this one. Uh, See if you go to Virginia, the next step is Germany. <laughs> well, Virginia, I can drive to Germany. <laughs> I have a little trouble getting around. Do you uh, have any questions? No. Okay, would you like to show us something? Yes, these? yes, I, I really would. Here, uh, do one thing in there now, in these oh. over, it'd be easier um, if you, you know, hold them up to the camera. <coughs> I was talking about the stamp that was made. Uh, the stamp was based on this picture here, which I had, which I had taken. Uh, you got to get close because you can see. Yeah, this has pans right in. Okay. All right. You can see the the Russians coming across and the GIs meeting in the middle of the bridge here, and that's how this and that's what the stamp. See, it's very small. I don't know if you could see this. Yeah, I think I can focus in on the stamps. Hold it up. Yeah, this, this right here. Would you mind if I took it? No, not at all. Which one is it? The this second one right here. Okay. Go right there. Okay, just, just point to it. If, okay, got it. Got it. Uh, the ceremony in Arlington. This was the how they displayed it. This before the stamp was issued. It's still it's like a 32 cent stamp. They have, but it came out as a 34 cent stamp. Okay. All right. These were the four GIs on the patrol. Why don't you uh, point out who is? Okay. This is uh, this is me. I was a baby, and this is uh, Lieutenant Robinson. This is James McDonald, and this is Frank Huff, and that's the Elbe River behind them. Okay. And on this top picture here, this is the general starting to row across, the American general starting to row across the Elbe where he's going to meet the Russian general. Okay. That was taken like the following day. Uh, now these are just pictures of... This is... Uh, that's the flag we made. I was going to ask you, do you know what happened to the flag? Can't find it. Can't find it. I've been in touch with the Eisenhower Museum and the Smithsonian, and they can't locate it. Uh, let me have that other row. <laughs> Yanks and Reds meet. This was in the papers the following, following day. All right. <laughs> Well, these are just articles of saying what happened on, on the patrol, you know. Now, this is Lieutenant Robinson with uh, the Russian that he met on the bridge. Okay, I'm getting a lot of reflection. Okay. I Better? Got it. Okay. There's an article about U.S. US flag 
with four stripes held historically up. Okay. Um, I just have one minute left. On That's this it? Tape, if you uh, yeah, this is General oh, Eisenhower. They're getting the flag. With that, the flag. This, is, a this is me. And I think that's Frank Huff. No, the other way around. That's me. That's Frank Huff. <laughs> okay, got it. And that's because he's generalizing hell. Okay. And here's an article. That I promote men in link up. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yes, that was wonderful. Exactly.